All right, welcome everyone to uh, Second Day Day Lecture. It's great to see you here. Thank you. Uh, love the attendance, love the chat. Um, I uh, have a couple of things to say before we get started today. Uh, first, I wanna apologize to everyone who had trouble with a vitamin. Um, we, uh, we totally overloaded our servers. Uh, I love the enthusiasm. Um, it took a while for the servers to, to catch up to the load. Um, we think we've got things figured out, so this hopefully shouldn't happen again for the future vitamins. Uh, and I just wanted to apologize to you for, the, for all the headaches for everyone went through. Um, a couple of announcements for uh, this week. Um, if you, uh, I hope lab one went well. If you felt like you didn't get enough time to finish the lab and you'd like to work your way all the way through it, we have what's called finish up labs today, uh, this afternoon. Um, we'll have course staff there. You don't have to sign up, just show up for any one of them. There's a little extra time. You can work with a partner or you can work on your own to finish up your lab. And we'll have course staff there to answer questions about the labs. So you're welcome and invited to come to those. Look on Piazza for the links. And if you're on the wait list, we have labs and discussion sections this weekend. Go onto Piazza, you'll find a pinned post on labs. And if you look down in the wait list section, you'll find there the times when those are available. Um, please, if you're on the wait list, attend a wait list section and attend a wait list lab. Attendance is mandatory and it's, uh, it's graded. Um, so uh, we hope you'll um, uh, show up this weekend to one of those. You don't need to sign up if you're on the wait list. You can go to any one of those uh, that works for you and your schedule. Um, if you're on the wait list, you'll get checked off this weekend. If you go to the wait list lab, you'll get recorded for attendance. Uh, you're all good. Uh, yes, if you attended lab this week, you can finish up on your own time if you want to, as long as you attended lab and you got checked off in lab. Okay, so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at um, correlation, uh, causation, uh, experiments, um, how we can draw conclusions um, from looking at data about um, uh, um, the effects of, um, of, for instance, uh, if I have a new experimental drug, the effects of that on health. Okay, so um, let's dive right into it. Uh, I'm sure we all read articles like this in the newspaper. For instance, here's one that's uh, suggesting that uh, drinking coffee um, uh, is beneficial, uh, reduces the risk of uh, cancer. Here's another one that's something saying something even stronger. Um, uh, for those of you, if you're, not a if you're not a coffee lover, but you like chocolate, here's maybe some good news. Uh, this article is reporting a link between uh, eating chocolate and uh, less heart disease. So, um, What's going on here is um, we're trying to draw some conclusions about the world. Each of these studies is trying to draw some conclusions about the way the world works um, uh, based on observations. And the observations uh, allow us to uh, gather some data. And what we're going to observe, we're going to observe something about um, uh, individuals. In each one of these experiments, we're observing something about a bunch of study participants. So there's a bunch of people, each, each individual, we observe something about them. They might be subjects in a study or participants or units. They don't have to be people. Uh, it might be cars or it might be countries or, or any other um, a unit of, uh, of analysis and comparison. Um, in the uh, study on, um, let's see, on chocolate, I believe it was European adults were the individuals. And then in each one of these um, uh, experiments, we, we do apply a treatment. Apply a treatment to some of the um, uh, individuals uh, in the study on chocolate consumption. The treatment was um, they ate some chocolate. So it might be in a medical study, you might think of this as we're giving them a drug or applying some medical treatment, but it doesn't have to be. There's no necess necessity this has anything to do with medical uh, anything. It could be uh, just whatever is the, uh, the action that we are looking at the effects of. Um, then finally, there's an outcome. Uh, the outcome is what we observe 
uh, uh, for each individual. It's the thing we care about, we're wondering where the effect that we're wondering about, okay? So in the case of the chocolate study, the outcome was, did this individual get heart disease within the next few years or not? Okay. Uh, and again, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be medically related. Um, all right. So now with that set up, anytime you have an experiment, kind of the first question that uh, we're going to ask once we've gathered some observations, some data is, is there any relationship between the treatment and the outcome? So in the chocolate study, uh, we're asking, is there any relation between chocolate consumption, eating chocolate, and heart disease, having the disease? Okay. So uh, the statistical, the word that we use in statistics for this is association. Um, association just means any relationship at all. It doesn't have to be that uh, the chocolate caused heart disease or caused lack of heart disease. It's just any connection. Um, it might be, sometimes people use the word link. I think that was what was used in this newspaper article, a link between chocolate consumption and heart disease. So um, let me ask you, what you think? Uh, well, uh, maybe before I ask you what you think, um, I, like, let me just pose the question. The question that comes out of the study is, is there an association between chocolate consumption and heart disease? And to answer that, we need to know something about the observations. We need to have some data. So the newspaper article is claiming yes, but uh, where did that come from? Well, um, if you go look into uh, the details of the study itself, here is what the study reported. Here's the data. The data found that, um, uh, well, it was looking at um, uh, uh, amount of, uh, cardiovascular disease among the participants and the participants were grouped into multiple tiers. Okay, so the top tier um, were the participants who ate the most chocolate, amount of chocolate that corresponded to about um, one chocolate bar a day. Okay, and the lowest tier had, um, were, didn't eat any chocolate at all. And they measured uh, the rate of heart disease um, for participants in each of these tiers. And what you can see from these numbers here is that um, uh, those in the top tier who ate uh, one bar of, of uh, chocolate a day um, developed a cardiovascular disease, 12% of them did, whereas 17% of those in, who didn't eat chocolate did. So um, uh, fewer people who ate a chocolate bar a day got uh, heart disease than those who didn't eat any chocolate. So now I will ask you the question, is there an association between chocolate consumption and heart disease? What do you think? Uh, why don't you go into the participants tab and click yes or no? All right, I see lots of answers here. Uh, we're trending heavy, heavy yes, um, some no's. Um, um, why don't we do this? Um, let's try a little experiment. Um, would someone uh, give me an answer why you might say yes? Raise your hand and uh, if you're willing to speak and um, uh, be part of the recording and I'll uh, call on you and you can... Uh, uh, share with me a reason why someone might say yes. Okay, Conan, um, go for it. Because there's an, a negative association since there's you know, less people who are uh, developing cardiovascular disease who are eating oh. chocolate, there's an association, negative association. Yeah, yeah, less people are developing cardiovascular disease. I like it. Okay, great. Um, now, why doesn't someone... Um, uh, who is willing to say why you might say no. Someone give me a reason why you might say no. So I'm going to clear everything and raise your hand if you're willing to comment about why you might say no. Um, how about Silesh? Uh, why might someone say hello? No? All right. All right. Uh, I was just thinking like maybe like it's the data is like not completely conclusive to say that there definitely is a link. 
like maybe there's some other factors you have to consider or like some like the type of chocolate could be different or there's many other variables that could be taken into consideration many other variables you could take into consideration yeah that makes sense why might we want to take those other variables into consideration uh so we can like narrow down our answer so instead of just chocolate it could be like it's milk chocolate that there's an association but like dark chocolate we don't know or something like that Okay, we might be wondering, does it depend on what kind of chocolate you want to have? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Let, let me see if there's anyone else who might want to comment on why you might say no. How about um, Quinn? Quinn, uh, did you have any other thoughts on why someone might say no? Yeah, I was just going to say because you have no data on the sample populations, like in terms of the size you have no um, idea in terms of the potential significance of a potential association. Right, okay. So you're thinking we don't have uh, enough, it's hard to know how many people were in the study. So like, was there a large enough sample size? Um, is it something we can extrapolate to everyone or were they only you know, 40 year old men? Good, yeah. okay. So it's hard to know what in inferences to draw. All right, so this is a good discussion, and I see in the chat one more point here. People saying, "Well, may, just maybe, maybe there's not actually like causation. Um, like you could imagine, um, uh, you know, maybe the, the, there are these differences in numbers, but it's not actually that the chocolate is making you is making you healthier. You could imagine. All right, so I can understand for all of those of you who said no, um, but what I'm going to say is yes. So my answer would be would be yes. There's an association. Um, and let me clarify what I mean by association. Um, we just mean that there's any link, there's any, um, uh, in this case, difference between the participants who are eating lots of chocolate and those who aren't. So regardless of what the reason for that is, regardless of whether it's something we can like uh, extrapolate to everyone in the world, um, regardless of whether that's causal or not, we call that an association. So the answer is yes, there's an association. All right. So now the next question that you might have been thinking of, you might jump to, is given there's a there is a association, is that causal? Is it that eating chocolate makes you healthier? Does eating chocolate lead to a reduction in heart disease? That's that's causality. And this question is a much more challenging question. It's also a much more interesting one. Usually, it's the one we care about, um, but it's also harder to answer. And uh, the data that we were just given um, doesn't necessarily uh, tell us enough to answer that question, all right? So you might have heard people say um, uh, correlation is not causation. And what they're saying is the existence of an association does not prove that there was a causal connection there. There might have been, there might not. And you can see this comment in, um, in one of the doctors who commented on this, which is study doesn't prove a cause and effect relationship. There's some kind of something interesting going on here, but it doesn't prove exactly why there was a connection here. Um, you might hypothesize that maybe chocolate makes you healthier, but it's also possible not. Okay, so I'm making this distinction between association and causation. And of course, I know immediately everyone wants to talk about does chocolate actually make you healthier? So we can just take a moment on that. Um, someone want to give me a, a reason in chat why uh, chocolate might not that might explain these numbers. Um, in a way that's consistent with chocolate, not making any difference to heart disease? Chocolate makes you happier. And then if you're happier, you have less heart disease. The types of people who eat chocolate are also the type of people who exercise more. Oh, that would be interesting if that was true. Uh-huh, uh uh-huh. less stress because you eat chocolate and then you're less stressed. And if you have less stress, then you don't have heart disease. All right, lots of great theories. There are all sorts of theories we could imagine, but there are any number of things that could be connected to eating more chocolate. Another example could be that maybe wealthy people eat more chocolate. Maybe it turns out that way. And poor people maybe can't afford to eat chocolate. Like they're, you know, if you're poor enough, you're spending all your money on, on just being able to survive and you can't afford luxuries like chocolate. And we know that wealthier people have better health outcomes and poorer people suffer more from, from, from poor from health problems. They, for instance, maybe they don't have access to the healthcare system or they can't go see a doctor. 
So that could be another possible explanation. So we have to be very careful here just because we've seen an association doesn't mean that it's actually a causation going on. Okay, so let me talk a little more about association. And um, I want to um, uh, discuss how we can establish causation. And I wanna tell you a story. And um, there's a story I particularly like um, with this uh, that dates back to um, the 1800s and um, infectious disease in uh, Britain. And this is a picture here illustrating uh, the spread of cholera um, in Britain. This is a, a major problem at the time these cities were very crowded. You can see um, people were, were packed in tight. The sanitary conditions were not that great. And um, infectious disease was a fact of life. Um, every so often, um, some kind of disease would just start spreading through. And um, uh, you know, one week, hundreds of people would die. Thousands of people would die. You know, hundreds of thousands of people would die. Uh, no one at the time really understood the the reason they didn't understand the germ theory of disease, they didn't understand what caused infectious diseases, they just knew that this happened from time to time and it spread through and people died and it was a fact of life that you really couldn't control. Um, and the people were, uh, you know, they, th this, was, this was something that happened to them, okay? Um, and so this picture is uh, talking about the spread of cholera. And um, uh, people didn't really understand what caused cholera. Um, they saw people die of it. Um, um, and uh, there were theories about there, about what the cause was. Um, and uh, uh, this was uh, before the days of, more or less before the days of microscopes. So we didn't really have a way to observe germs. So how, I mean, I could feel a lot of sympathy for folks. How could they have known? Um, they couldn't see the bacteria that were causing this. So they were trying to find some explanation for this, this uh, what was happening in their lives that made such a huge difference to them. And one of the leading theories at the time was called uh, miasmas, the theory of miasmas, which was that um, uh, what caused um, a disease was bad smells, like bad smells given off by waste or by, uh, by rotting, something rotting, smelled bad. Um, and this is, uh, you know, we, today we might laugh at it, but, but actually I think it's a remarkably clever and brilliant theory that was awfully close to reality. It's not quite right, but it was super close because there is a connection uh, between these bad smells, if you think about it, and, um, and, uh, and sickness. Like if you're living in unsanitary conditions, probably stuff smells bad. And people noticed, so I think it's, it's, it's impressive that people noticed this, this correlation, this association, um, and made it, and so they formed a connection. And the, and, the, and the hypothesis they had was that this was causing the disease, that the bad smells caused the disease. So that was known as um, miasmatism. And if you believed in this, you were a miasmatist. And if you can say the title three times fast, well, that is a good tongue twister. All right, so this was believed to be the main source of disease. And, and like, uh, you know, so it immediately suggests what you could do to keep yourself healthy and keep yourself safe. So one, one of the suggested remedies was fly to clean air like leave to the countryside. Maybe this is a familiar uh, topic in the days of COVID. Um, another suggestion, uh, you've heard the nursery rhyme involves a pocket full of posies. So what was that referring to? The, uh, that was referring to the miasma theory of disease. The idea was if you carried around some sweet smelling flowers, then if you came across a miasma, maybe you could sort of ward it off or overpower it by like holding up some flowers to your nose and then you'd smell the good smells rather than the bad smells. One of the more crazy suggestions at the time was uh, fire off several barrels of gunpowder in the center of London because the smell of the burning gunpowder would, um, would, would over, overpower the bad smells. <laughs> I don't think that one was ever actually implemented. So like, it sounds kind of crazy, but um, this was actually a mainstream belief. This was the leading belief. And there were uh, very firm believers from some well-known um, uh, people, very respectable, for instance, Florence Nightingale, who we all know as a, a founder of modern uh, nursing, um, believed in the miasma theory. Um, and, and actually, th I think it arguably contributed to her being effective because uh, the way I've heard the story told is that she bad smells were a cause of sickness. And so she went through and just um, meticulously cleaned the hospitals where she worked and she established the standard. Um, and so she thought, and, and, it and it worked, right? And so she figured, well, okay, I've got rid of the, you know, it's working because I got rid of the bad smells. Well, it was working, it's working for different reasons. This meticulous cleaning was reducing um, spread of disease through germs. She didn't know that, but, um, uh, and, you know, we had folks like the leading uh, experts on public health uh, uh, subscribing to this miasma theory of disease. Okay, well, there was one guy who didn't, didn't believe in, it was this uh, doctor, anesthesiologist uh, by the name of John Snow, who um, is a modern, is a hero to modern public health because 
he tracked down the source of cholera. And I want to talk to you about how he did that. Um, he um, was trying to establish um, uh, where cholera came from. And so um, uh, what he did was he um, gathered data. He was kind of one of the earliest data scientists. He gathered data. And then he did something we do today a lot, which is he made a visualization of the data to help him try to understand what might be going on and to try to identify some possible patterns or some possible explanations. So this is uh, John Snow's map of, uh, that he drew after one um, cholera outbreak. Um, and while everyone at the time believed this was caused by miasmas, uh, John Snow um, didn't believe it. So let me talk you through this map and what conclusions you can draw from it. Yeah, this is not the Game of Thrones John Snow. This is a different John Snow. We've got an H in his name. Um, it, you can see here, uh, he hand drew, I mean, this is, look at how uh, amazing people were at the time with their, with, their, with their handwriting and everything. So this is a map of an area where there was a cholera outbreak. And um, he went and um, talked to everyone in the neighborhood and he gathered data on the deaths and he made a visualization of all the deaths. So um, each one of these little uh, bars, these little rectangles represents someone who died, okay? So like over here, you can see two people died at the house here. So he drew the bars next to the location where they died. And here there were like five people who died. And this big collection of, bar, of bars, oh my gosh, a lot of people died in this, in this uh, compound here. Um, and um, he looked at this and based on this, he formed the um, uh, suspicion that this was not caused by uh, smells, but rather by um, water. He looked at the symptoms of the people who got sick and then died and they got diarrhea and they got nauseous. And he thought, ah, it must be something they ate or it must be something they drink. And so he went and he mapped the location of all the water pumps. People didn't have running water. They went to the you know, communal pump uh, to pump their water each day. And so he mapped all the locations of the pump. So here's the Broad Street pump. And um, uh, let's see what else we can see in here. Um, we have, um, uh, I think there was a Rupert Street pump or something over here. And uh, you can see a whole bunch of other pumps that are marked in various places around this map. Okay. Um, so then as he started to map this visualization, um, he started, you know, getting some, he started to test his hypothesis. Okay, so what do you do when you have this, this hypothesis is you look at the data to see whether the data appears to be consistent with that, with that guess, that hypothesis, and, and where is it inconsistent with it? Um, and so for instance, right around the Broad Street pump, you can see a lot of deaths happened around it. So his suspicion was that the people who lived near the Broad Street pump, went to the Broad Street pump, and there was something going on with the water at the Broad Street pump, something associated with the Broad Street pump that was causing the people to get sick. And so, you know, on first glance, it kind of makes sense. You would figure people who live near the Broad, in this general area are going to the Broad Street pump, and that's, that is the area where there's a lot of deaths. Um, and if you look at one of the other pumps, um, uh, there's another pump down here, you can just barely see it, but there's um, there's a, there's you know smaller number of, of deaths um, the further away you get from the Broad Street pump where presumably people are getting their water from elsewhere, but it's not perfect. Um, for instance, um, you notice that down here there are a few deaths, even though um, those people are closer to the Rupert Street pump than to the Broad Street pump. So that kind of seems to contradict his hypothesis. But then he went to talk to each one of the people in that household to find out what was going on. And he discovered that the folks, many of the folks down here actually were still going to the Broad Street pump, even though it looks further away on the map, the Rupert Street pump was on this dead end and you had to kind of go this convoluted route to get there. And the Rupert Street pump was actually farther to get to than it looks like on the map. And so the Broad Street pump was closer. So then he's, okay, started to gain some more confidence in his hypothesis. Um, uh, then he started to look around um, for things that might contradict the hypothesis. And he noticed, for instance, that um, uh, this workhouse here had um, a lot of people there. It was kind of a workhouse for the poor, but not too many deaths. Um, and so he was thinking, well, that, that kind of doesn't make sense. But then he went and talked to them and asked them where they got their water. And it turns out the answer is they had their own private well. So they didn't go to the Broad Street Pump. So, okay, 
maybe that makes sense. And he was noticing this brewery had a lot of employees who lived there at the brewery and worked there, but no deaths. What was going on there? He went to talk to them and they said, well, we drink our own, um, we drink mostly drink our own brew. <laughs> We're not drinking from the public pump. And we also have a private, private well. So, okay, ah, okay, all right. This is starting to sound more and more consistent with this theory that it could be something to do with the Broad Street pump. And then he discovered there were a few people who lived kind of far away. I think they're not even shown on this map who had died around the time of this outbreak. And uh, so that was really weird because clearly they were, not, they were not close to the Broad Street pump, but he went to talk to them and it turned out it was like a pair of old ladies who had previously lived right around in this area. Then they moved to some other neighborhood and they didn't like the water in that other neighborhood. So they were getting delivered every day water from the Broad Street pump that tasted good um, and they got sick and they died. Okay, so now he was feeling really convinced that there was something going on with this Broad Street pump. So he went to the um, public health commissioners in this neighborhood and he convinced them. It was a multiple hour meeting where he presented all his evidence and he finally convinced them there was something going on with this pump. I don't know what it was. And he convinced them to remove the handle of the pump so that people would no longer use it and wouldn't get water from there and they go elsewhere. And um, uh, sure enough, um, then after that happened, the number of deaths in this cholera deaths went way down. Now, I think it might have been on the trailing end of the epidemic, so the number of deaths might have gone down anyway, but um, I think today many people suspect that it's likely that he reduced the number of deaths. He might have saved the lives of another pe number of people in this neighborhood um, through his uh, detective work um, using a visualization and tracking down um, uh, his theory and testing his theory against the data. All right. So in this case, this would be an example where there was a really clear association between the Broad Street pump and the dirty water. So this made him suspicious of the miasma theory and made him suspicious that it was uh, dirty water. But you might notice at this point, it's not really a proof that it's bad water that's causing cholera because uh, still we've only got an association. It's, it's pretty suggestive evidence, but I wouldn't call this proof yet. So to get proof, he had to um, go a little farther. Um, I'll just mention before I move on to the next step that um, uh, today John Snow is famous as a uh, founder of epidemiology and public health. Um, if you go on Google Maps today, you can find the neighborhood still looks pretty similar. And um, today there's a, a pub at the location where the Broad Street pump was. Um, here's the pub, it's called the John Snow pub in honor of that. Um, and at the front of this picture, you can see that black thing is the pump itself. You might notice there is no handle um, the, that has been preserved as a historical artifact, as a reminder of uh, this great accomplishment of John Snow. Okay, so uh, let's talk now about causation. So John Snow wanted, was, uh, wanted to establish causation. He hadn't established causation. So how is he going to do that? He did, uh, his next step was um, that... Um, he needed to find a more systematic way to verify whether water was causing the problem. Um, and to, for this, um, what uh, I should give you a little bit of background about <clears throat> how um, people got water in London. And uh, there were multiple uh, water companies. Um, many people got water from, delivered from a water company. Um, not everyone got from a pump, public pump. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry for that interruption. Um, and you can see two of them here. One is a uh, Southwark and Fall, I guess, S and V anyway, it was one company. Um, and the other was Lambeth. And they both got their water from the River Thames, um, which runs through London, but um, they got it from different locations on the River Thames. And um, S and V got uh, downstream in the river downstream, downstream of a place where sewage was introduced, dumped into the river. And Lambeth got um, water upstream uh, before the sewage was introduced. So, so John Snow was thinking, um, uh, you know, here's a pretty good way to test my hypothesis because Lambeth uh, folks, folks who subscribe to Lambeth's water delivery service are getting cleaner water and the SNV is getting dirtier water. And so he's decided to focus especially on this area of overlap where um, both companies served. And the reason was because then um, folks who lived in that area um, there were going to be no systematic differences between the SNV customers and the Lambeth customers. They were from the same neighborhoods. They had the same characteristics. It's just a matter of uh, happenstance whether they happen to subscribe to SNV or to Lambeth. 
Okay, so um, uh, he um, this enabled him to do a apples to apples comparison between people who are getting clean water and people who are getting dirty water. Okay, so he had a treatment group and he had a control group. And in general, when we're doing a controlled experiment, this is what we're going to look for. We're going to look for uh, two groups that will enable us to make a comparison. And the treatment group gets the treatment and the control group doesn't. So in this case, you could consider the treatment to be the clean water and the control group to be the dirty water or vice versa, if you like. Okay, the control group doesn't get the treatment. And um, the crucial difference is that if you design the experiment well, there should be no difference between people, like no systematic difference between people in the treatment group and the control group, except whether they get the treatment or not. Okay, so you can see this in this quote from John Snow, where he said the thing he was highlighting was there's no difference whatsoever in the houses or the people receiving the supply of the two water companies among the folks in this area of overlap or in any of the physical conditions with which they are surrounded, other than whether they're getting their water from SNV or from Lambert. Okay, so that means the two groups, the SNV customers, group one, and the Lambeth customers, group two, were similar, except the only systematic difference is whether they got the treatment or not, whether they got the dirty water or the clean water. Okay, so that enables us to do a controlled comparison where we know if there's any difference between the outcomes in these two groups, the only possible explanation is due to the treatment, is due to the dirty versus the clean water. There's nothing else that explain it because there were no other differences. So now, um, given that setup, we can look at some data. And here I'm reporting the data uh, that Jon Snow gathered about cholera deaths among the customers of SNV and customers of Lambeth in this area of overlap. And I'm also sharing, just for comparison, uh, cholera deaths among everyone in uh, London, just so you can have a comparison point. So I would like you to um, take a look at this and let's just look whether there's an association for now. Uh, look at this data and see whether you think there's an association among the folks in this area of overlap between getting dirty water and getting cholera. All right, I see lots of yeses. So let's figure out how we would, where we would get that from, what we would look at. Well, you might start by looking at the number of cholera deaths. In SNV, there's way more cholera deaths with SNV than with Lambeth. A lot more deaths. But that isn't really a fair comparison because SNV also has more customers. So to make it a fair comparison, what we really need to do is the number of deaths um, divided by the number of customers in some sense, number of deaths per 10,000 houses, let's say. And so that's why we have this last column. If we look at the last column, then we see that the number of deaths um, uh, per customer is about almost 10 times higher for SNV customers than for uh, Lambeth customers. Okay, so um, that clearly shows a higher rate of cholera death among SNV customers. So that indicates there's an association. So we've answered the first question, is there association? Yes, there's a link, there's some relationship. So now how do we go from association to causality in this case? Here's the key bit. In this, in this example, the only difference between the treatment and the control group between SNV and the Lambeth customers was whether they got dirty or clean water. So that's the only thing that could possibly explain this difference in outcome. Um, in particular, um, John Snow concluded that the dirty water must be causing higher cholera deaths. Okay, so there's no other explanation that seems plausibly consistent with this data, because whatever else you think might be causing cholera was present in equal amounts in both the SNV group and the Lambeth group, in both the treatment group and the control group. What about income? Yeah, if one of these was more expensive than the other, absolutely great comment in chat. If, if one of these companies was more expensive, like let's say Lambeth cost twice as much, so it mostly tended to have uh, wealthy households and if uh, SNV had mostly poor households, well then that would be a systematic difference between the treatment and the control group. 
other than the treatment itself, other than the dirty versus clean water. In that case, then we would not be able to establish causality. But in this case, Jon Snow got lucky and it turned out they cost about the same. And so there was no systematic difference in wealth. So you definitely have to explore that question. Um, and um, so he was on a little bit, you know, uncertain ground because you got to check each one of those, those those things that could be different. But John checked all the differences he could think of and he couldn't find any systematic differences. So on that basis, he was able to uh, um, infer causality. So this is how we infer causality when we have an association is if there's only one thing that could possibly account for the difference. Now, you could be a little bit careful as a side remark. This uh, tells you causality. Uh, we need a separate step to know whether that means that dirty water causes cholera or whether cholera causes dirty water. But in this case, it's pretty obvious. Um, I drank, <laughs> I chose my water company first, and then I got cholera. Um, and, and moreover, you can't imagine, I can't imagine any way that me getting sick causes a company's water to become dirtier. So uh, in this case, it's clear. Okay. So um, what we're getting at here um, is what can go wrong is if we don't have that nice situation. If there are other systematic differences between the treatment and the control group, then, um, then we have what's called confounding factors. So let me talk to you a little bit about what could go wrong. Here's where you could get into trouble. If the two groups have other systematic differences beyond just the treatment, then it might be difficult or impossible to determine whether there's any causality, okay? So uh, we just talked about an example. If these groups differed not only in clean versus dirty water, but also in income, then we wouldn't know whether what was making the difference was the water or was the income, okay? So in that case, um, the income would be called a confounding factor. Confounding because it confounds us. It's like, ah, I can't tell what's going on. Um, whenever you have an observational study, these differences are often present. So an observational study is where um, people basically self-select into either the treatment or the control group. And we as experimenters have no influence over that. We don't, we're not in control of it. We are just observing. Okay, that's why it's called an observational study. It's a purely passive observational stance on the part of the experimenter where the experimenter is not... Um, is not intervening in any way, okay? So whenever you have an observational study, you have to be very careful about confounding factors. Confounding factors can cause, uh, can, can, can lead you astray very easily, okay? Um, um, all right, so that's a, that's a beware whenever you have an observational study. So what do we do about this problem? Well, sometimes we get really lucky like Jon Snow did and like I said in the chat, he just hit the lottery with this, this particular case where you got really lucky that there was this overlap where there was no systematic difference and the only difference was the water. And so sometimes you get really lucky and, and things work out like that. But um, the other uh, way that we can um, deal with this problem is by making our own luck. So rather than just passively observing, we as experimenters can control the conditions. We can um, um, intervene um, to force things to go our way. Okay, so if here be an example of a confounding factor to illustrate what can go wrong with observational study. Say we have an observational study where we measure the number of shark attacks in each month and we measure uh, the sale of ice cream in each month. Then you can see here from, this is a kind of a made up plot, um, but let's imagine we get data that looks something like this where um, ice cream sales peak in July and shark attacks peak in July. Does that mean that eating ice cream, you know, makes you tastier and therefore more likely to get bitten by a shark? Uh, no, probably not. It's more likely that the summer months are hot and we like to eat ice cream when it's hot and the sharks um, migrate. And so they come to be on our beaches when it's hot. Okay. So confounding factor was temperature. And it was temperature that explained um, uh, this association, not anything about uh, the ice cream causing shark attacks. Okay, so in this case, we'd say there is an association, but there's no causality. It's not, it's not causation. Okay, so to eliminate confounding factors, as experimenters, we design an experiment where we take control of things and we control who we assign to the treatment group and to the control group 
to ensure that there's no difference between the two groups other than whether they get the treatment. Now you could imagine trying to very carefully match people up and take your participants and match two of them up that are exactly identical in every respect. And then one of them you assign to receive the treatment, they get put in the treatment group and the other you assign to not receive the treatment, they get put in the control group. And um, that would work in principle, except that in real life, you know, everybody is unique and you never, you, you're just not gonna succeed in finding pairs of people who are absolutely identical in every respect. So instead, what we do is we use randomization. We take each participant as, we, as they come and we flip a coin. And based on the outcome of that coin, we either give them the treatment or we don't. And now we know, we know what determined whether they got the treatment. We know that um, that's influenced by us. It's not influenced by any other factor, not influenced by any other confounding factor. So there can be no confounding factor. In particular, if you have a large number of participants, then you'll have a, um, uh, then there will be very, very likely no systematic difference between the two groups in anything other than this one thing that we force to be different, which, which is whether they got the treatment or not. Okay, so that ensures that um, we're in a situation where the only difference between the treatment and the control group is who got the treatment, whether they got the treatment or not, which then puts us in a situation where we can infer causality. And so if we find an association in this kind of randomized situation, then we can infer that must be a causal connection. We know that it's not caused by confounding factors because we ensure there would be no confounding factors. All right, so randomization can be very helpful. This is called a randomized controlled experiment. It's an experiment because we had uh, some treatment and some outcomes that we observed and gathered data on. It's a controlled experiment. Controlled means there was a control group, okay? So we didn't treat everyone. We took some people and we didn't treat them. That's always an issue, right? Uh, because it means you got to tell some people who enroll in your study, some of you are not going to get this new drug. That's a controlled experiment. And a randomized controlled experiment is where we decide uh, the assignment into treatment versus um, control in a randomized way. And randomized controlled experiments are, um, in some case, uh, in some sense, um, more or less kind of a gold standard for a careful way to do an experiment where we can eliminate these confounding factors. Um, randomized controlled experiments are, are good because they uh, solve the problem of confounding factors. Okay. Now, um, uh, a note of caution, be careful. This word random um, in everyday usage doesn't mean the same thing as what we mean here in uh, statistics and data science. If you look up in the dictionary, you ask a person on the street what's meant by random, um, they might say, well, it could have turned out in any number of different ways or was kind of unpredictable or or haphazard, but that's not what we mean when we use the word random. We're gonna use the word random in this very particular technical uh, meaning, which is not just, you know, turned out as it may, but random means like um, we understand uh, uh, exactly what the possibilities were and we've arranged, maybe they're all equally likely or, or we can um, mathematically characterize uh, exactly what's going on. So if I went on to um, walk down on the street and I asked the next 10 people to pass who were passing by, well, I might wait a long time these days, but um, imagine we got out of the COVID days and I asked the next 10 people to ask me by and I asked them some question and that's my, that's my sample. Um, uh, a lay person might consider it random because I didn't control who happened by. It's sort of haphazard or uh, uh, you know, whoever they were is whoever I took. But we would not consider that random in statistics because um, uh, it was not, um, uh, there are any number of biases that might be present that are not, um, that are not, they're hard to account for, um, they're hard to control. For instance, I might get people who um, walk to work rather than people who drive to work. And that might introduce a bias in people. Okay, so uh, if you do polling, um, pollsters are very careful about choosing random samples that will be truly random. They're not just convenient or haphazard, um, and they've discovered that's very important for accuracy. Otherwise, you can suffer from bias. Okay. Um, so in, in summary, if I summarize where we got today, um, uh, data can help you establish an association, but you need something more to establish causation. Usually causation is what we really care about. Um, causation can be established using randomized controlled experiments. If you don't have a randomized controlled experiment, beware of confounding factors because they can lead you astray 
um, and they can make it impossible to infer ca uh, a causation. And um, I will leave you here um, with this uh, last uh, fun example of a comic from XKCD. All right, everyone, um, please do the vitamin uh, after class. If you're on the wait list, please go to the waitlist labs this weekend. Um, uh, we will release uh, homework one uh, later today. That'll be due next Thursday. So you could get, a, you could get an early start on that. Um, uh, we would love to see you in office hours. Come visit us in office hours. Office hours start next week. Um, come visit either with questions or even if you don't have a question, uh, you can come to our group office hours and hang out and hear what other people are asking. Thank you all. I'll see you on Monday and I'll stick around after lecture if you have any uh, other questions.